Hello, I'm John Watson and welcome to our Point of View special from Field Days 2013. On this show I'll be interviewing Leader of the Opposition David Shearer and the Prime Minister John Key. Well, first up we have Leader of the Opposition David Shearer. Uh, Mr Shearer, thank you for joining us today. The theme of this year's Field Days is getting down to business in a global economy. How well do you think we're doing at that? We're doing very well. Um, there's no doubt about that. We are a le the leading agricultural exporter in the world. Uh, we've got the expertise and you only have to look around field days here to see the, the type of innovation that's going on. In fact, it's the reason I love coming here is to actually see that innovation and see that Kiwi ingenuity being put into real practical process, if you like, in order to be able to, to maximise what we do. Um, but can we work harder? Yeah, of course we can. Um, and we, uh, there are other markets out there, obviously, that uh, we could do better in. Speaking of markets, do you think we're putting too many eggs in one basket uh, in terms of trade with China? Do you think we should be spreading that risk or taking advantage of that growing market? Well, I think China will grow, and every everything that uh, every trend, every economic trend shows that this, this is a market that is going to keep on expanding. Uh, what has been good around uh, China has been a pretty much a bipartisan view about China's importance between the national government and the former Labour government and the future Labour government. Uh, we signed the free trade agreement with China, this government has picked it up and carried it on. We've pr practically doubled our exports. So there's immense, uh, there's immense potential there, but it sh doesn't mean that we should be ignoring other markets. Um, and work had been already started with free trade agreement with China, with Russia, uh, some, of those other, some of those other states and of course with the TPP that could open up even further markets, Mexico for example. Um, those issues are issues that transcend governments, uh, things that we were very keen on pursuing and this government's wanting to pursue as well. But do you think this government is doing a good job of that or would you be doing things differently to John Key? Uh, I, we, would, we would try and um, move those free trade agreements on a little faster than that they are at the moment. I think they've done a pretty good job in terms of our uh, associations with China. They're doing the same sort of things that I think are, are important, which are taking business trips up to China, making those high-level connections, which I think are really, really important. I think we could possibly do better also at the, at the smaller level, perhaps not the, the, the Fonterra side, but you know the, some of the smaller companies, and that includes some of the agricultural manufacturing companies that sometimes have a, a bit of a problem getting a leg in the door into a, a big market like China. It's complicated and I think uh, we could do some more, certainly put some more uh, emphasis in on that as well. Uh, on the topic of China still, and the red meat exports which were held up in Chinese ports recently, do you think there was more than just a paperwork issue involved? Yeah, I think there, were, there, there was actually more uh, involved and behind it and uh, the government hasn't been forthcoming in telling us what exactly that, that was. I mean, I always am very suspicious when I see an agriculture minister blame officials. Um, I actually think that the buck stops with the minister. Uh, that's a fundamental of our democracy. If there was more involved than just a paperwork issue, what was it? Because our dairy exports were still being allowed through with the same paperwork, and there were theories floating around uh, about China being protectionist of its own borders. Do you think there's any truth to that? Well, this is, this is rumour and we haven't got to the bottom of it. We've been asking some questions and uh, I would be very interested to hear what Nathan Guy and uh, Mr Key have got to say about that. But I, what I do believe is that unless we have the resource on the ground in China, uh, we're not going to be able to speed things through in the way that we should. And if that is true, at least we get a much better heads up of what's actually going on in the politics behind the scenes. Um, and that is important in these, in these countries. It's not just simply about paperwork, ticking it off and moving forward. You actually do have to have uh, those people on the ground who are working the, working the networks, if you like. Um, it, it's a, it's a, an old truism, but, a, but it's reality that we need to be able to do that. You talked about the importance of food safety. Recently, uh, the Chinese media and an industry body have voiced concerns around our uh, infant milk formula industry. Uh, Liam Dan wrote recently in the Herald that our honeymoon period with China is over. Do you think it's over? I think we're at risk of having it over. We, at, at, at all costs we must be able to give the Chinese government and its people uh, the, the, uh, the confidence that our, that our food is the best in the world. 
Now, right at the moment, they don't have confidence that what they're eating is, is, is great, but they do know that New Zealand produces the finest food anywhere in, uh, in, in the, on the globe. So we need to give them that, that reassurance. And I think with the melamine and uh, DCD incidents that have happened, first with the melamine, we moved in there very quickly and, and shut it down. DCD, I'm not sure that we did that as quickly as, as we could have. We need to front foot these things, reassure people. It's not actually, you can tell people until you're blue in the face, this is safe, but it's not, a, it's not the science so much, it's the perception. And so therefore we needed to make sure that we were upfront about that and I think the government didn't get in front of the ball. They let it roll out way too, too quickly and as a result of that, we could have damaged our, our, our industry. We certainly put a dent in some of the confidence that the, the Chinese have in our, in our uh, agricultural exports. What are your thoughts on uh, China's new president? Uh, modern, I think he's going to be very different from, uh, from the past president. Um, I think what's going to happen uh, is, is he's talking up the chi China taking its place in the world in a much more, I wouldn't say aggressive way, but a much more assertive way than we've seen in the past. Uh, he also realised that there's an enormous amount of pressure to deliver for the rest of the country. Uh, he recently sent out a memo banning universities uh, from teaching what he called the seven evils, which included things like civil society and a freedom of the press. You have a humanitarian background. How much do you think our relationship and trade with China should be affected by their human rights record? Well, it's very important that we, we establish what our human rights record is and we communicate that to the Chinese. And, um, and as leaders of the opposition, I've had many delegations of Chinese um, come and visit me. Um, I invariably raise the issue of, of human rights with them for the very simple reason that, one, it's important to us. Two, they need to know that. And three, you can't just broadcast that from the, uh, on the TV without having, having the, uh, the, the conversation behind the scenes as well. So it's important to be very upfront and honest with them about that. Um, I don't believe that an economy can, can grow as it, as it has and you have the economic changes in China without political changes coming as well. And so I think um, invariably there's going to be calls for more democracy, greater human rights, greater transparency and accountability. China at the moment, even ha now, has real issues in and around uh, corruption and accountability. Um, and they're going to have to face up to that. What can farmers expect from a Labour government uh, should you win power at the next election? Oh, firstly, um, that we understand how important the agricultural industry is, the agricultural sector is to New Zealand. Uh, it's interesting walking around here around uh, field days because obviously this is not exactly what you would call uh, labour, um, uh, sort of a, a labour electorate around here. Uh, yet a lot of people come up to me and they say, hey, great that you, you're here. Um, you know, we've always done better under a labour government, the agricultural sector. And then I asked them, um, so who do you vote for? And he said, oh, no, I still vote for National. <laughs> and in a way, um, I think that Farmers and the farming community know that Labour can deliver on the agriculture. So let's face it, Fonterra is a, it was a, a baby born in, un, under a Labour government. We've made the changes that we need to make. Uh, it will be much more hands-on. We'll put a very a high uh, primacy on, uh, on biosecurity, and our, securing our borders, food safety, obviously environmental standards. And I'm just over at Fonterra just now talking through some of that. And I mean, they're doing some terrific work in that area. I think we're really making some gains there. Um, and monetary policy. Uh, and this is something that the government won't touch. We will uh, look at changing the Reserve Bank Act, so to give the Reserve Bank the ability to bring the exchange, or to help exporters effectively, uh, and, and, and modify the exchange rate to, to, for the benefit of exporters. That'll bring, bring the dollar down. Effectively, yeah, so that billions of dollars extra can be earned by our exporters, which obviously um, overwhelmingly is the agricultural sector. I suppose a concern for many farmers is that with the Labour Greens coalition government there would become more regulation around protecting the environment. Uh, in a Labour Greens coalition government, how much influence would the Green Party have on deciding policies to do with our primary sector? Well it depends, I mean first of all um, we've said very clearly that um, the finance portfolio will be with um, the largest party which will be Labour. Um, I don't think farmers have got a lot to worry about, to be quite honest with you. I mean, obviously, the Greens have want to uh, clean, have clean rivers. 
I haven't met a farmer who doesn't want a clean river. And uh, talking to Fonterra, and we see how far we want, they want to go on that. I mean, it's it's pretty exceptional sort of a work, work that's that's been carried on. It's actually a question around timing. What we don't want to do is drive a whole lot of farmers to the wall and to bankruptcy um, in the effort to do that. So. It's, it is around timing, but all of that's negotiable. I actually just don't think that there's a, there's a big issue. I think it's been talked up much more, and I'm sure John Key will talk it up as well. It's really about uh, being sensible. And I think farmers know that, uh, you know, we've got Damien O'Connor here as our agricultural spokesperson. Um, we're pretty sensible and straightforward and often can do more than the national government can, take the tough decisions that perhaps they aren't able to do. Mr Shearer, thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, it's time for a break on our Point of View special coming to you from Field Days 2013. Stick around. After the break, I'll be interviewing Prime Minister John Key. And welcome back to our Point of View special coming to you from Field Days 2013. Well, joining me now is Prime Minister John Key. Prime Minister, thank you for joining us. No problem, Sean. Great to be here. The theme of this year's Field Days is getting down to business in a global economy. How well do you think we're doing at that? I think we're doing very well. I mean, if you think about um, agriculture, I mean, that's the basis of New Zealand's trade. So three quarters of everything we sell is either agriculture, aquaculture, you know, comes off the land, forestry. So, you know, very, very important. And of course, we're a big international supplier, particularly in dairy, where we're, a, you know, a huge international seller, even though we're quite a small proportion of global trade. So, look, our farmers doing a brilliant job right across the board. New Zealand is obviously pro-free trade, but there are many countries out there that do protect their own domestic supply. What's the current international mood, if you will, uh, towards free trade? Is it moving towards our interests? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we have got some good things on the go. I mean, TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade with, um, amongst others, the United States and Japan, Canada, Mexico, very important if we can get that over the line. So. Assuming we could, without Japan, which is a late addition, it was valued at about $2.1 billion a year for the New Zealand economy. So that's a lot of extra money, a lot of extra taxes and jobs. And, and that's the value of free trade. And the, the kind of counter to that is that if you don't get free trade agreements, you're actually going backwards. So we're off to Korea in a few weeks' time. Uh, one thing that's happened there is they've got an FTA with both the United States and Europe and so our suppliers, our, our farmers are actually getting locked out of those markets so it's both offensive and defensive. Speaking of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the meetings happen behind closed doors. Why is there a lack of transparency around that? It's always the way when you do an FTA, so there's nothing unusual or different about the way TPP is being negotiated to other FTAs. And the reason is, is that you go through what's called chapters, there's about 26 I think from memory in, in TPP, but there's a lot. And, and each and every one of those ultimately involves negotiations give and take by all the partners. If you're having that through the media, what inevitably happens is that people see this bit and they don't see the other bit. It creates all sorts of rows and diversions, but it doesn't actually get you over the line. The, the reason why I don't worry about that is because it's not because I don't want people to have a view, but every FTA New Zealand signs has to be ratified by our parliament. So our parliament has to vote on that. So in the end, if there's major New Zealand opposition to something, say, the government um, agrees to, if we can't get it through our par parliament, it doesn't happen. How do you respond to people that say our free trade agreements aren't free? They're free for the countries that we're trading with because we don't charge them any tariffs to export things here, but we're still charged uh, tariffs when we export them. Why aren't uh, our free trade agreements fully reciprocal? Generally, we, we don't sign a free trade agreement unless it's, unless it's the official term is high quality and comprehensive. So what that means is total elimination of tariffs um, and quotas over time. So in the end, yes, they, they, they will be fully eliminated over time, and yes, there will be a completely level playing field, but sometimes it takes some time. So even the China FTA had a phase out over a period of time. Now, yeah, the argument's a fair one, but New Zealand dropped all of those sort of barriers, if you like, a long time ago, because actually it's better for your economy. It's been the right thing to do. 
But if we were just said to some of these countries, well, you've got to go cold turkey overnight, it's all or nothing, they wouldn't sign a deal. How are we doing in convincing other countries that uh, free trade is beneficial to them in the long term? Generally pretty well. I mean, if you take the, the biggest multilateral type of agreement we could do, it's through the World Trade Organization, and obviously we were really disappointed our guy, Tim Grosser, didn't get up to head the WTO. That's now in the hands of a Brazilian, so we hope that they'll make progress. But even if that doesn't happen, then we're pushing that through regional partnerships like TPP or RCEP, which is one we're in in Asia, uh, or bilateral deals with you know with countries like Korea. I mean, look, generally speaking, there's always protectionism out there to a degree, but the, the world is becoming a more global place. And if you ask President Obama if he was sitting in this chair, he'd say the same thing to you that he said to me, which is in the end, it's one of the only levers he can pull, and so he wants free trade for America. So we've got a lot of people supporting us. How do you answer farmers that are concerned about the amount of land being sold to foreigners? Because at the end of the day, that's land that we could be using for production. There's a few things. Firstly, the, the level of foreign ownership of land is probably considerably lower than they estimate it to be. So there's sometimes it's you know, reality and sometimes there's perception. The perception is that the ownership is higher than it is, in fact is. And Lynn's put out some material late last year looking at um, who owned land in New Zealand, it was around about 1%. It fluctuates between 1% and 5% all the time. So the first thing is to say, well, is it real? The second thing is there's no question that there are foreigners buying, no question. It's not just the Chinese. In fact, they've been much smaller buyers than American pension funds and the Australians and the Germans. So if we took them out of the market and just said you can't buy, what would be the effect of that? So short term it would take some liquidity away from the market and, and maybe prices would fall. And some people might argue that's a good thing. But overall, if there was a big issue in New Zealand and we needed those buyers to come in, you're the farmer that's worked for 40 years and want to sell, you want to know that there's some price tension in there. So my view is if it became a really serious issue, we would tighten up the rules more. But our perception at the moment is that it's not nearly as significant an issue as people might think. Our exports to China have grown from $2 billion in 2007 to $6.9 billion now. That's huge growth, but are we putting too many of our eggs in one basket with China? It's a really fair question. I mean, one of the risks we've got is that China is so large and, and getting so much larger, we could have massive concentration risk in, pharma, in, in China with all of our products going there. I mean, in the end, they would literally buy everything we produce, probably if we let them or wanted to. So. What I always say to, to you know, Fonterra, and, and look, they, they're very smart about this stuff anyway, and anyone else that wants to listen, New Zealand's got to diversify where it sells to, because if it's just solely China, and they one day decide they don't like New Zealand, or there's a political issue, or whatever takes place, then that could have huge ramifications for New Zealand. But there's no question, one of the reasons I go to places like Latin America, or India and stuff, or the Gulf states, is, isn't because I think they're the biggest market today, it's to make sure we diversify where we sell. On the issue of the meat debacle in China recently where exports of our meat were held up at their border, was that just a question of paperwork or do you believe there's a possibility that there was more involved? No, I think it's largely paperwork. I mean, what, what's happened there is we were converting away from New Zealand food safety into MPI. Um, essentially, we got agreement across a whole lot of areas, but not meat. Um, our guys then went back and said, well, if I put MPI on but use the old form, because they were trying to develop a new form, that should be right. And sort of close enough was good enough for a while, and then the Chinese got a bit fussy about it. Now, at, on one level, you can say, well, that was annoying, took a bit of time, was a political issue. But on the other side of the coin, I mean, if the Chinese do genuinely tighten up in terms of their importation regulations and their paperwork and adherence to that, that's actually a good thing for New Zealand because our risk is that some meat comes in under a New Zealand label is actually poor quality, not New Zealand meat, and it taints our brand. So in a perverse kind of way, it's not an entirely bad thing. I don't think they were really playing games. I think if they, the message we were getting out of the Chinese when we were up there was they want to buy a lot more meat from New Zealand, and I actually genuinely believe them that they want to do that. If it was just a question of paperwork though, why couldn't it have been resolved over the phone in a couple of days? Why did it take months and a trade delegation to fly to China? Firstly, initially when we got advice of it, it was a bit of, I think MPI thought it wasn't nearly as serious as it was. They thought it was isolated and we get often get containers or shipments stopped at the border in lots of countries. Then it sort of emerged it was a much broader issue. Then it was a bit unclear about exactly what was driving the problem and by the time we actually got to all of that, 
then we had to work our way through it. Now, yeah, I could have made a phone call to Xi Jinping, the new Chinese president. Probably that would have fixed it overnight. But on the other side of the coin, that's a card we want to play when we really need it. And actually, we got we got there anyway. So in reality, it was frozen meat. It stayed on the wharf a little bit longer. The chilled meat got through anyway. And look, we probably saved a bit of the political capital for another day. So you don't give any credence to theories floating around that China was trying to protect its own domestic meat supply? No, they're not true actually. I mean, when, we, when I was in China for the most recent visit, one of the things that the senior Chinese leadership said to me is they want to buy more meat. And the reason they want to buy more meat is because their population is getting wealthier, their demand curve is going up, and their local production can't supply them. Now, what is true, they absolutely want to build their local capability, both in dairy um, and, and meat, no question about it. Uh, but there's just this massive demand emerging for New Zealand meat. Now, they, they don't have to come and say to us, look, let us improve more of your plants, take more of your meat. I mean, if they didn't really want to do it, they wouldn't do it. The Chinese do what the Chinese want to do. And there's no question in my mind they want our product. China doesn't have the best record when it comes to human rights. How does or should that affect our trade relationship with them or any other country for that matter? I don't think it should affect our trade relationship. I think it should uh, be part of the conversation we have with those countries, and it does. So in the case of human rights, Foreign Affairs raises those issues at an ambassadorial level with the Chinese Foreign Affairs Department on a regular basis. It came up in my conversation with the Premier of China, Li Qixiang. So it's not that we shy away from it, but I mean, in the end, if we're going to take the view we'll only sell um, goods and services to countries that we agree with and everything they do and everything they have, then that could be a very challenging situation. I mean, take America. Uh, we're great mates with the Americans, we're historical allies and we're probably still allies. But they have the death penalty in Texas and we don't agree with that either. And they have Guantanamo Bay and there'd be plenty of New Zealanders who wouldn't agree with that. So, you know, where do you draw the line? With election year looming, how confident are you on a national win, given that the ACT Party and the United Future Party uh, don't have a very likely future? Well, I think it depends always on the hands of the voters. I mean, do they want us back? But, I mean, we've, we will have been there six years. We'll have one of the highest growth rates, lowest unemployment rates in the, in the world. Um, we've got on top, massively on top of New Zealand's debt position. We've guided us through the global financial crisis and the Canterbury earthquakes, and we're building a stronger, more robust economy on the back of improving health, education and, and crime statistics. So, I mean, do I think we've done a pretty good job in the last five years? I mean, you expect me to say yes, but the truth is I, I genuinely think we have. Of course it'll be tough. I mean, in the end, if our voters want us back, they're going to have to come out and vote. And in 2011, a lot of them said nationals are shooing, they're going to bolt in, I'll go and play golf that day, I'll go and do something else. But, but we can't afford that this time. Personally, I think we'll win. Um, but we'll only win if the New Zealand public want us there. And, and you've got to earn that right. And I, I try and do that every day. I mean, it's why I'm somewhere different around the country two, three, four days a week and I spend you know, 24 hours a day thinking about it or every, at least waking out thinking about it uh, about how I can make the country stronger because I know in the end it's a privilege to be there and one day your time will be up and um, I want to get back obviously I'm fiercely competitive and I, I believe in what we're doing. Prime Minister thank you for your time. Thanks a lot. And that's our point of view special coming to you from Field Days 2013. Thank you to my guests, the Honourable David Shearer and Prime Minister John Key. I'm John Watson. Thank you for watching.